There are two truly puzzling criminal mysteries in South Australia that are known around the world. The 1966 abduction of the Beaumont children from Glenelg and the discovery of an unidentified man dead on Somerton Beach in 1948. There is another equally enigmatic mystery that has been forgotten for decades. On the 20th of March 1939, a body was discovered floating in the water of the Port River at Port Adelaide, South Australia. It appeared to be a simple drowning, the tragic death of a young man. Although it was quickly forgotten, as Australia became embroiled in the Second World War soon after, it is one of the most mysterious cases in Australian history. Ronald Graham Snashell was a 15-year-old who lived with his stepsister, Mrs Emily Roach, in Wattle Avenue, Queenstown, a suburb to the south of Port Adelaide. Early on the morning of the 17th of March, he rose and ate breakfast. He had been employed casually at Silbert, Sharp and Bishop, a firm of fruit packers in Port Adelaide, and hoped to pick up some work that day. He rode his bicycle the short distance from home, leaving the house about 8.10 or 8.15 a.m., and arrived shortly after at the factory in Todd Street. He spoke to William Frederick Morris, a supervisor who had occasionally hired him to work for the fruit company. However, he had no work for Ronald that day. Nobody seems to know how Ronald spent the remainder of Friday. He did not return home. At 6.15pm that evening, Ronald went to 10 Lydon Place, Portland, to visit a mate of his, Graham Knowles. Lydon Place was just around the corner from the house of his sister, Mrs Perlino Sullivan, at 27 Grace Church Street. Knowles said that Ronald was on foot when he saw him, wearing slippers and with no sign of his bicycle. The two teenagers arranged to meet up again later in the evening in Port Adelaide. The rendezvous was not kept. A sometime workmate about the same age as Ronald, Alva Basil Gale, saw Ronald in Commercial Road, Port Adelaide at 6.56pm. Early in the investigation, it was said Ronald had been seen walking with two other youths along Commercial Road at 7.20pm, but this was never mentioned again and may have been a misidentification. He was seen again by another acquaintance from work in Port Adelaide, this time in St Vincent Street at 7.30pm. Gladys Taylor said he did not speak to her, but acknowledged her with a nod of his head. After that, there were no reported sightings of Ronald until a body was seen by a clerk named William LeRae, floating upright, the face just out of the water near number 17 berth, at 10am Monday morning, 20th of March. Police retrieved the body from the water of the 16th berth of number 2 key at 10.15am. They theorised that Ronald had been riding his bicycle near the edge of the wharves and had fallen in. Police dragged the water on the 22nd of March in an attempt to find the bike and pinpoint where he had gone in, but despite diligent efforts, the bicycle was never located. Nobody reported seeing or hearing the youth fall into the water or hear any cry for help. Ronald was also known to be a strong swimmer. Had he been conscious after a fall into the water, there is no reason to think he could not have swum to safety. Also strangely, Nobody reported seeing the body in the river over the weekend, despite the commercial activity, fishing and other activities, and numbers of people living in close proximity to the docks. The body was fished out and taken to the morgue at the Port Adelaide Casualty Hospital. As Ronald's family had reported him missing, they were called upon to identify the body. His stepsister, Emily Roach, said the face was so decomposed that she could not identify the features. She, however, said the corpse had one leg shorter than the other. When Ronald was a child, he had suffered either tuberculosis or rheumatism, which had caused the slight deformity. He limped as a result, which was becoming more pronounced the older he became. His brother Howard also identified the body by a scar on one of his legs, caused by barbed wire, and by the sand shoes and belt he was wearing. Howard said he had sometimes borrowed the shoes to wear himself. A piece of blue crayon was found in one of the pockets. Ronald had been given such a piece of crayon at work with which to brand cases of apples. The funeral for Ronald Snashaw 
took place at Cheltenham Cemetery on the 22nd of March. To this point it was a cut and dried case. Ronald had drowned and it was assumed the inquest at the Port Adelaide Council Chambers in May 1939 would affirm that it was a tragic accident. Instead, the true mystery of the case was only now about to be revealed by the medical examination made by Dr John Ellison Porter. Although Ronald Snashill had been seen alive on Friday evening and the body found two and a half days later, it was the doctor's opinion that the body was so decomposed that it must have been in the water for at least seven to ten days. The facial features had been completely destroyed by the action of marine life. A drowned body did not usually rise to the surface until seven days had elapsed, and he had never seen a body so decomposed after just four days. There was no sign of violence or any head injuries noted. Having said so, he added that there could have been bruises on the head that decomposition had obscured. He believed that the person was alive when they entered the water. Dr Porter further added that he could see no visible difference in the length of the legs and had measured them, finding that they were of almost identical length. Nor could he see the scar that Ronald's family said they could observe. Dr Porter's evidence could not be easily dismissed, as he was, as he was considered one of the state's top authorities on drowning deaths, with 15 years experience behind him in examining deaths by drowning. If Ronald had only been in the water since Friday evening, then everything medical science professed to know about the action of water on a corpse was wrong. He had consulted other medical opinion which agreed with him. He said a body decomposed twice as quickly in air as in water. This evidence caused a major problem. The thought began to circulate that the body was not that of Ronald Snashell. Police even checked local cemeteries to determine if any graves had been disturbed and a corpse dug up and dressed in Ronald's clothes. They found no evidence that anything as macabre had happened. They also had samples of water from the Port River tested in case some pollutant in the water had caused rapid deterioration of the body. The water was found to be normal. Eventually over a hundred people were interviewed, but nothing new was learned about the events of the 17th of March. Police were convinced that the body was that of Ronald Snashell, but the coroner had his doubts. On the 19th of April, detectives again searched the murky water of Number 2 Key for Ronald's missing bicycle. Ronald's mother, Mrs Annie Snashell, in her evidence to the inquest remarked that she had scolded Ronald about six months prior when he told her that he was riding his bicycle near the edge of the docks and had nearly fallen over the edge. She identified a belt found on the corpse as belonging to her son. William Morris, the supervisor at the fruit packing factory, gave evidence that lads would frequently skylark on the edge of the wharf near the factory. He had warned Ronald to be cautious near the edge of the wharf in the past. Morris had been taken to view the body on March 20th, and he said that he did not think the body was that of Ronald Snashell. In his opinion, the head appeared to be that of a fully grown man, rather than a youth. Graham Knoll's father, Henry, Alva Gale, and a man named Arthur Nelson all testified that they had definitely seen Ronald in the Portland area between 6 and 7 p.m. on Friday night, 17th of March. The coroner, Mr Arthur Blackburn, adjourned the inquest on the 17th of May, hopeful that publicity about the case could rouse something which could resolve the impasse. Seven months passed until the inquest was resumed on the 16th of December, 1939. The coroner was disappointed for nothing had come to light. There had been no sightings of Ronald in the intervening months, nor any word from him. Gladys Ellen Taylor, the erstwhile work colleague, who was the last person known to have seen Ronald, related the encounter in St Vincent Street. She said he was wearing a blue open-necked shirt and trousers. She did not notice a bicycle. She also added that Ronald had fairly dark curly hair, which she would not have called red. Dr Porter had said that the hair on the body had a distinct tinge of red to it. Both Emily Roach and William Morris stated that Ronald had dark brown hair. The coroner brought the proceedings to a close by stating, If I accept the medical evidence, 
which I am informed accords with all authoritative medical literature on the subject, I am unable to say that this is the body of Snashel. I therefore find that a male person whose identity is not established to my satisfaction came to his death at Port Adelaide through drowning shortly before March 20th, but there is no evidence to show how such a person got into the river. If it is desired to identify this body with that of Ronald Graham Snashel, or to prove that Snashel is dead, appropriate steps for that purpose must be taken before the appropriate tribunal. Despite the uncertainty, proposals to exhume the body in May and again in December were not taken up. While today a DNA test could have swiftly resolved the uncertainty, in 1939 it was not considered exhumation would assist with settling the case. Today the burial location in Cheltenham Cemetery has been redeveloped and repurposed for new graves, and it is unlikely any remains of Ronald could be located with any degree of certainty. So the body in the river was dressed in the clothes of Ronald Snashel. The Snashel family insisted the body was that of Ronald. If it were him, how did the rapid decomposition occur? The medical evidence said it could not be him, and an employer who had known Ronald was certain the body was not his, but an older man. And where was Ronald during the day? Why was he wearing slippers and not the sand shoes later found on the corpse in the river when he visited his friend? What happened to his bicycle? Could another body have been substituted? But why and by whom? It sounds almost too much like a pulp detective mystery to be possible. And if so, where was Ronald Snashel? As a coda to this case, on the 27th of January 1940, a seaman named William Casely Stantford had arrived at his lodgings in Grace Church Street, Portland, about 6.20pm in the evening, in a state of drunkenness. He had lodged at the address for three years when in Port Adelaide, and had previously been warned about his excessive drinking, and had been asked to leave, but on his promise of turning over a new leaf, was allowed back. This night, however, he was so drunk that in trying to shave he cut his face so much that his landlady asked him to stop shaving. He replied to her that it was a pity that he hadn't cut his throat. Stantiford is then said to have incessantly nagged his landlady until one of her sons told him to shut up, and pushed him back into a chair. It was said he rushed at the sun to attack him, and both fell to the floor struggling. On getting to his feet, Stantiford grabbed the landlady and tore the sleeve off of her frock. At this point he was run out of the house by her two sons. The landlady said there was a box on of the type you would expect in dealing with a drunken man. Stantiford told at least three other seamen he knew that he had been in a fight that night and had fallen into the gutter because of it. He took himself off to the schooner Gerard on which he was working. Norman Giffen, the chief officer, found Stantiford dead on his bunk the next morning. He had died in his sleep from a fractured skull. The coroner, who was again Mr. A. S. Blackburn, was unable to say how Stantiford had received the injuries, as his remarks about the fight made before his death were not substantiated. The landlady was Annie Maud Snashel, and the sons who threw him out of the house were Ronald's brothers, Colin and Howard. The people close to the heart of this mystery are long dead. Ronald's mother Annie died aged 56 on the 3rd of February 1945. His father, Colin Graham Snashel, was 58 when he passed away on the 24th of April 1951. Emily Roach died in 1964, three years after her husband had passed away. Ronald's brother Howard was just 42 when he died in January 1965, and his other brother Colin died on the 14th of January 1982, aged 60. His half-brother Raymond George was killed at Trebrook in 1941, aged 26, and his half-sister Perlene Mackenzie died aged 45 in 1956. Graham Knowles, the friend who saw Ronald that evening, died aged only 34, in 1955. Dr. Porter, whose evidence set the cat among the pigeons, passed away aged 50 in 1947. The strange circumstances surrounding the Snashel case 
seemed destined to remain as much a riddle forever as on the warm evening that Ronald Stashaw walked along Commercial Road and into the dark corners of history.